Hi, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Slime Time Side Quest, an official Dragon's Den podcast. This is Platyam3. And this is Yangus the Legendary Bandit. So we've uh, bounced back and forth between NES and the Super Nintendo Final Fantasy games in our first side quest. And we bounced back and forth between Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance titles in our second side quest. Uh, tonight we're going to stay more focused on hardware, but we're going to broaden the genre horizon a little bit. We're not just going to stick to role-playing games. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You mean there's more games out there than RPGs to play? Wow. You learn something new every day, I guess, man. I mean, you've got to go back to the NES days to actually find me playing non-RPGs, so uh, I totally know what you mean by that. <laughs> well, I, you know, I do think that the NES does have a pretty good library of games that we could talk about. There certainly are a lot of good ones to choose from. Uh, yeah, and to do that, we've got joining us tonight, we've got a slightly smaller crew to this side quest with, um, but, you know, NES games, they weren't exactly known for having a lot of uh, memory space there. So uh, we're going to go with a typical four-party size in role-playing games. We've got, of course, me, Hero. We've got uh, Warrior Yangus. We've got our very own Sage Burian, And everyone's favorite goof-off, Matt Craft. Hey, guys. I'm going to be a Sage one day. You can grow up to be one. You can be whatever you want when you grow up. I'm going to Dharma Temple. It's going to be a fun time. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Matt, this is 2020. You're going to All Trades Abbey. I'm going to go see the Jack of All Trades. Uh, but will you be the master of Strum? <laughs> <laughs> we, we all went there. <laughs> Just simultaneous. That was perfect. <laughs> Oh, funny. All right. Well, with our intros out of the way, let's dust off the NES, plug in the old CRTV, and let's party like it's 1985, because we're going to be playing not just with power, but with Nintendo power. Oh, very good. Okay, so uh, before we get any farther here, um, Matt Craft, I'm going to call on you first for your game, but uh, hold on. <laughs> I, I don't know if that still works. I'm blowing into the mic here because, you know, to get these games to work, often you had to blow into them. Don't don't forget the light tap on the side of the uh, NES as well. Oh, yep. Don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Matt Craft, we'll start with you. Um, we'll go in reverse alphabetical order of your games. You wanted to talk about one. I've never heard about this, so I'm interested to hear you start off with this. Fax Xanadu. You seriously have never heard of Fax Xanadu? I have I never heard of it. Nope. <laughs> Lighten I'm us. Going a, I'm going a little bit off of Wikipedia here, but uh, Facts Xanadu is kind of like a side-scroller. It is a spin-off of Xanadu, which is Falcom, as in Y's, Y-S. They have a series called Dragon Slayer, which is pretty much just top-down screen, hack and slash, kill things. Uh, I think it's called The Legacy of the Wizard is actually a Dragon Slayer title. That's a very but, good game. In fact, Sanadu, you play as a long-haired dude with a beard walking into town as the intro. It seriously just shows him going da 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 da. It's actually entertaining. The U.S. box art says, Daggers and wing boots, monsters and monsters await you, which is very true. You are an elf, even though you don't have the ears. You are tasked to save the world tree, which is the basic overworld of the game where you go from place to place, killing monsters, collecting items, yada, yada, yada. <sighs> it has a really quite the expansive story and a very good medieval setting. As the story unfolds, it actually reveals that the elves and drawers lived in, you know, relatively peaceful before a meteorite falls onto the fall onto the world tree. It basically trashes the place and the evil one comes out of it, which is obviously alien. Alien takes over the world tree and well, you go through four different overworld areas from the bottom of the tree to the very top top. Sorry. And you just basically go around the on the entire place. It's a very entertaining side-scrolling RPG. One of the things that I liked about it was there's an item that you get kind of early on. You want to buy a couple of them when you get it called the wing boots. It makes you fly. 
So you can go in places inside the world tree that you shouldn't even be going to with it. It's one of the earliest game breakers that I've that I've actually seen. Otherwise than that, I really can't think of much more than that. Yeah, the, a lot of NES games, you know, that's you take them at face value and that's what you did. Mm-hmm. So did you have that game growing up or is it something you've discovered later on emulating? Or? I, I actually had it growing up and uh, the moment it came out on virtual console for my Wii, I bought it. came out in 2011. I even remember that barring the freaking, uh, what do you call it? We ver- barring the original release, but uh, the last time I actually played it, I am along. It's dead, of course, but uh, there is a Yeast fan forum, and one of the people there did a restoration hack for Faxanadu. Because, as all of you know, a lot of NES games either have stuff that's been cut out, or they just didn't really have time to complete it, so they put it out as is. Mm-hmm. And the last time I played it was with this restoration hack, which is on ROM hacking. It fixes a couple of the items in game that they kind of didn't have time to finish, and actually set a uh, in game save system. And that's how I ended up finishing that. Hmm. So, it was a spin off from Xanadu? Yep. And Xanadu has continued on. I think there. Well, actually, right now I know there's a couple games on Steam that are in the Xanadu series called Xanadu Returns and Xanadu Tokyo, and they're fairly decent hack and slashes. Fam, uh, Falcom doesn't really screw up when it comes to their lineup. Yeah, they usually turn out pretty good RPGs with stuff like uh, the Legend of Heroes series and like the Yeez games, especially with the modern releases. Oh, Tokyo Xanadu, I know that one. Sadly enough, Falcom is more well known for the Trail series now than Yeez, and that kind of makes me sad. Really? I didn't know they did the Trails games, but I guess yeah. that makes sense. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. But really, both of them, both series are still pretty niche for the most part in the West. Like even though Yeez has been around for years, it's still not something that's like a big, well-known action RPG series. But it did mm-hmm. get some more recognition with uh, Yeez Eight. So I've seen a lot of people talk about that one highly, uh, regardless of what system they play it on. Yeah, and I mean, I, even the Trail series, you know, it seems so big because we all read about RPGs and everything. But in the grand scheme of things, like, it's not, it, it might hit a thousand, a million copies, but it's not doing anything. You know, it's I'm no Animal per- Crossings. <laughs> it's just long I games, wanted- too, so... <laughs> That's a big I'm not going to get into it because it is really long, but I originally wanted to do the Yee series that came out on the NES, but no. <laughs> There's Too quite many. a bit there. All right, let me uh, get back to where I was. And, uh, all right, got Fax Xanadu out of the way. I'm going to mm-hmm. jump in and do my first game because, you know, we were talking about not doing RPGs, so I thought of a game that is an RPG, of course. Um, <laughs> is it Dragon Quest? No, I was going to go there. I was going to go there because it's been so long. And I was trying to come up with some more obscure titles. Uh, one of the ones I was actually playing it the other day, Bionic Commando, was that, that was one of my favorites back in the day. And it was interesting because you didn't jump. There was no jump button. It was a slides, side-scrolling one that you didn't jump in. You had a bionic arm that could stretch up. But uh, I, I couldn't... I could, couldn't gleam enough from that to talk more than like a minute on. So today I was like, oh, I know what one of my favorite games was there. It, it's a series that, Matt, you've actually bought me a game in this series that I have put maybe an hour into. And uh, other than this one game, I've not really touched a Castlevania game in forever. So I'm going to talk about Castlevania II, Simon's Curse. This is a... Uh, what did I buy you? Symphony of the Night? You did. I remember you sent me like a dollar ninety nine one day and was like, it just popped up on... What is it? Google Play Store. Buy it now. I just sent you the money for it. Oh, I hope you bought it. You did. I did. I, like, I was sitting at dinner. I'm like, okay, well, he sent me $1.99. Let me buy it on the Play Store. Um, so I bought that and played it. But, yeah, Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest. Uh, this is the one. It's it's kind of like the Zelda 2 of the Castlevania series, from what I understand. It is definitely something different, and I think that's why I liked it. I remember I would sit, and I was reading, reading, getting some background information on it, too, on Wikipedia. 
today, and there was a password system, if I'm not mistaken, for the NES version of this that came out over here. Um, apparently they had some other way of doing that in Japan. Um, kind of, I guess, like the reverse of Dragon Quest, where we got the battery in our Dragon Warrior games, but they started off with long-ass passwords. Um, Simon's Quest was not the just go through area after area, beat bosses, and take on Dracula of the um, like uh, the other Castlevania 1 and 3 were at the time. This one had like an open world, and you could go to different places. It had a day-night cycle. Um, there were NPCs galore in the towns that you could talk to. You could gather hearts, which were like the money, um, and you could use them to buy stuff in the stores. Uh, I want to say there were whip upgrades that were available depending on which towns you were in. Um, it, it was totally different from the first Castlevania. The first Castlevania, I felt like I couldn't keep making progress and I, I can't remember if I ever beat it when I was young. I'm not good at action games at all and I, I think I beat two Mario games and that's about it. My six-year-old, I think, has beaten more action games this year than I have in the past 25 combined. I actually I actually beat Simon's Quest 2 very recently and... Oh. Uh, yeah, it is. A, it's a very. Um, you kind of have to know what to do and where to go in that game. There's and some yeah. tricky stuff. There's some there tricky is. stuff. And part of it was bad translation. Yes. Yeah. There were some. Uh, I guess there were some hidden clues, and some of the NPCs lie to you. They flat out. Yeah. Have... Um, they they do. I played. I played Simon's Quest Two on the Castlevania collection that they did for modern systems, mm -hmm. but it's it's basically the NAS game, but with save states if you want it. Oh. And save states are kind of needed for that game. <laughs> One of my favorite lines from that game. What a horrible night to have a curse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like every time it would switch from day to night, like different people would talk. All the NPCs turned into zombies in the towns. Yeah. Uh, there were enemies around. and It was it was a very um, interesting... I remember there was... I, I, I got up all of the hearts to buy one of the whips that you can mm -hmm. get in the game. And it basically is no better than the whip that you bought before it so you spend all that time accruing all of that currency to buy the whip and it's basically no better than the thing that you just bought oh man but i looked up how long to beat this game um on the website how long to beat the other day and it said about four hours and i i really have no memory of using any sort of password for this system reading about that had a password i'm like man did i even know that existed or this is one of those games when i was like 12 13 or something like that and it was a saturday i would put in play for an hour and a half maybe leave it paused with the game running go mow the yard come back and play for another two hours and just beat it like I, I remember distinctly beating this at least a few different times but like it was a game that i would sit and play all day and get through um it i don't know just to me i i think i got this even before dragon warrior so because this came out in 1988 see i don't even think i got my nes till like 90 and i can't remember when dragon warrior one came out maybe later that year but like this one I think was kind of one of my early oh i like games like this i like making progress earning experience leveling up yeah i don't think i really knew what an rpg was until dragon warrior afterwards but yeah it, this one reviews really poorly um at least nowadays i know back back in the day whatever nintendo gave everything good grades but like looking at some of the websites that are on the uh, like GameSpot, 6.5 out of 10, Famitsu, 28 out of 40. I didn't realize they gave scores less than 30. You know? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that either. <laughs> especially, especially old Famitsu. They, yeah. They were they were a lot more harsh on their stuff, but still. So, uh, I it, yeah, it's different. It was different than number one, which you know number three was kind of the same after that. I've not played the series. Like I said, more than an hour or two after the NES days, I just, it's not something that really interested me. But if there was other titles in the quest, more like Simon's Quest, maybe I'd, or maybe I'd do it. But it, it, I don't know, it was one of those games, and it, it had to be that time of my life where this is something I could sit down and beat in one pretty long sitting. You know, I might have to grind in a couple places. Like uh, in Super Mario Brothers, I'd sit down and I'm like, I'm going to beat this, but I'm going to make sure I get to the level where I can jump on the damn shell and get 100 lives. And uh, <laughs> then, then I know I can beat it because I know I'm not very good at these games. But 
Yeah, yeah I you, was, had to, oh, sorry, you had go to ahead. go to five different mansions. I mean, and kind of like Zelda, you had to go five different places, five spread all over the world, collect body body parts to put uh, Dracula back together, and then kill him. <laughs> I believe I remember like Dracula's rib, like using yes, it as an that, item. Yeah, that was one of them. So. I liked a, a lot of the bosses in that game. You could kind of just run past them to get <laughs> yeah. to, to get the item. Uh, if you went through the mansion and death was the boss at the end of one of them, you could literally just run through the room and get the Dracula item and run back through the room without fighting death. But if you fought death, you got the golden dagger, I believe, which did more damage and consumed less hearts to use, I believe. Mm -hmm. I remember my introduction to Simon's Quest was um, years ago when, like, the uh, angry video game nerd was, like, one of the brand new things on YouTube. And I still remember his video and how he would just, like, k ripping the crap out of some of the stuff that was in that game, like you guys are talking about, where it was really hard to find some of the secrets. Now, with the angry video game nerd, he was already pretty exaggerated with some of his stuff. But I remember the one thing that he just absolutely just kept like losing his mind over was like how the NPCs just flat out lied to you. Like you guys were talking about a little bit ago. I still, I still remember that being one of my first introductions to Castlevania. And I thought, Oh man, this series must be like just notoriously evil. And I was kind of right, but not in quite that same way. <laughs> <laughs> Matt craft. Did you play this one? No, but I actually have something pretty interesting in symphony of the night. As most people know, no spoilers. If you do the right things, you get to go to an inverted version of Dracula's castle. And you actually get to collect Dracula's remains. They are accessories that up your stats. Mm -hmm. But you get Dracula's rib, Dracula's eye. And I thought it was a pretty nice shout out to uh, Castlevania 2. Hmm. Oh, scrolling down here on Wikipedia, uh, Castlevania 2 was the cover of the second ever Nintendo Power. Oh, yeah. So. It's the notorious one where they're huh. holding Dracula's head. Yeah. right. <laughs> yep. It, it, it got, there's a guy all dressed up holding Dracula's head. <laughs> I remember reading Nintendo Power one time in high school, and they had a little, a brief little article about some of the most embarrassing cover art that they did for um, previous issues of the magazine, and that was the number one, was that at one, because they got so many complaint letters about that with them holding up the severed head. <laughs> <laughs> Like I'm, I'm not really big on Castlevania either, like you are, Matt. But you know, I was really, I really enjoyed it that they added like Simon and Richter Belmont to Smash Brothers, and I really like like one of the main themes that's from Castlevania too. I don't remember the name of the song, but it's the main theme that plays the dun 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 dun. dun, dun. It's that one. And uh, I think that's Vampire Killer. I think that yeah, that does not sound right. Sure. But um, I always thought that that was a really cool song, and I like that how. Like with some of those NES games where even if the sequels were kind of different from the originals, that they could still have really good elements to them. And while they might not have clicked with everybody gaming-wise, like, you know, they found an audience with you, Matt, since you remember most everything from that game and are talking about it pretty fondly. So Yeah, I mean... And I actually like... Uh, sorry. Oh, I, was gonna I actually say, liked... I only actually like the uh, Symphony of the Night in any game that will let you use anything but a whip. <laughs> well, then what, what were you going to say, Platty? Sorry. I was going to say, like, big series. I haven't played much Zelda. I haven't played much Castlevania. But the ones I remember fondly, the ones I really liked, Zelda 2 on the NES and Castlevania 2 on the NES. And those are probably the bastard stepchildren that they didn't go back to games like that. <laughs> they really should have. So I'm sure but I'm sure there's reasons later. why they didn't and have become and stayed popular, but oh well. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Uh, instead of uh, Simon's curse, we'll go to uh, a much better hero for this next one, one that we all know and love so well. Burian, tell us about Fester's Quest. Oh man, <laughs> Fester's Quest. What what can I say about Fester's Quest except that a lot of people have probably called it one of the worst games to ever hit the NES. <laughs> um, it's it's kind of this very weird kind of game because it 
you know, at the at the time that Fester's Quest came out, which I believe it was 88, 89, it was a couple of years before the 91 movie with Raul Julia and all that that kind of brought popularity back to Adam's family. But um, basically, the uh, one of the guys at Sunsoft, one, the American branch of Sunsoft, I believe, um, did an interview about 10 years back um, and he kind of led into I had this dream about doing a Fester's Playhouse video game and I had to convince my company to let me make this game even though it is for a video you know for a franchise that has not been on the air for about 30 years at this point point." and this company was Sunsoft the people who at the time had just put out Blaster Master and he eventually convinced them to obtain the rights to make a game for the Adams family. So if you've ever played Fester's Quest, you might kind of think, oh, this kind of play this kind of drives like the Blaster Master game. And it does, because it was I think it was made on the same engine. But um, you know, in the opening of the game, you've got Fester sitting out uh, you know, at the at the Adams mansion, sun or er, moon bathing in the midnight moon. And uh, an alien ship falls down over the city from afar and starts beaming down. And Fester turns to the screen to the audience and lets out a very surprised look. Now, you might ask yourself, why aliens? Why Adam's family? None of these questions are actually very relevant. <laughs> but um, the gameplay is... Uh, not what you would have what you would have expected from an Adams Family game, and there's been several Adams Family games since. Uh, I know there were two others. Uh, the Adams it was just plainly called the Adams Family, and then there was a Pugsley's Quest game for the NES. But more or less, um, this game, gosh, how 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 to how to explain it? Um, it's a top down game. And you kind of move around through different sections. Um, the more the, the majority of the game features Fester in kind of an overhead view, exploring the streets and the cities of or the, the streets of an you know unnamed, undetermined city. And you fight all of these kind of random, weird alien creatures, which has no bearing to Adam's family as a franchise. It was just kind of a, a play off of this guy's dream he had with wanting to do a fester game um it's also notoriously difficult because at the time you know there was a sunsoft american office a sunsoft japanese office and they were working on the game at the same time they were kind of sitting sending stuff back and forth back and forth and because of this there was a lot of poor communication between the two different teams that were working on it sunsoft japan sunsoft america and because of that, there were a lot of issues with the game. Now, the game kind of is a Zelda-style game to where you uh, move through different areas, do different things. And um, probably one of the most, uh, another notorious kind of problem with the game is that if you ever get a game over, you have the option to, you know, either just kind of accept your game over or continue. Um, between the two studios, they had, you know, back in the day, you've got dev tools that let you access any point in the game at any time. None of them thought to implement a checkpoint feature in the game. So you can get 90% of the way through the game, get a game over, hit continue, and you start back at the start point at the very beginning of the game and have to walk your way back through the entire game. Bosses are already defeated, but you have to work your way through all of the enemies again and take the path all the way back to where you died to continue on making this game a kind of one sitting kind of game if you were good enough at it that sounds horrible it <laughs> is it's 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 very it's very horrible um because most of the uh roads that you explore on the surface they're they're bad in shape they have mats of pits which block you from accessing you know different areas of the city therefore you have to kind of go above and below ground there's a whole um item system to the game so it's kind of a, a shooter with you know you earn items throughout the game you get money to uh to buy uh health back you get the the enemies would drop 
literally a kind of plethora of different kind of things from money to light bulbs to like just so many different things um but it was a very hard game did did any of you guys ever play it nope but uh this was kind of actually kind of funny i don't know where my youngest son has been thinking about the adams family lately but he asked me the other day to play it in the car on the way to school um and so we, we've got a 40 minute drive every morning after we drop his older brother off at his school we drive to my school and he was asking about playing that song the other day so i was just like hey alexa play the adams family and it started playing the um like the broadway musical everything there's a musical there's <laughs> i apparently because like it started going through like and you hear him singing lines and Whatever it, the whole album's on, at free Amazon's. Uh, they did a movie app. last. They did a movie last year, I think, about it about yeah. the Adams family. Mm-hmm. So uh, we didn't listen to that. I went back. I got the theme song from the the old TV show because he likes singing along to that one and snapping. But the next day we get in the car and I swear my phone. The second it tries to connect to my car, it always wants to play. It, it, if it if I haven't completely like restarted my phone, it'll pull up Amazon and start playing music immediately. And it started playing it, and he was like, "Oh, we'll listen to this. Listen to the whole freaking Amazon <laughs> musical, <laughs> or Adam that." Not the Amazon musical, the Adams Family one, the whole thing the other day in the car. Man, I was gonna laugh if you said that it started playing that like really bad rap song from like the live action movies from the nineties. Because <laughs> oh, no. there, there is a rap song where it's like the Adams Family, the Adams Family, you got fester. Da, da, da. Like, it's just, it's just so bad. <laughs> that that's the uh, that's the credits roll theme for uh, the nineteen ninety one movie. Was that for the first one or was that for the sequel? I can't remember. Uh, there was the 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 credits song for the 1991 movie was a rap song. Okay, that must have been the original one then, because that that sounds right at least when I say it like that. Because I think oh. the sequel used something different. Because like what the second one's called like Adam's Family Values, where Fester tries to get married, and I think that one had a different credit song. So another another cool feature about the you know this this Fester's Quest game was that when you got to it's really weird because like I said earlier you kind of worked your way through um, kind of Zelda style maps and everything like the overworld and the underworld and the underworld itself is just a sewer they're all just <laughs> one big map but you're you're exploring sections of them as a time and you use the sewers as a means of moving from one section to another. And it was always really dumb because when you were working your way through the game, as you killed enemies, they would drop these um, kind of uh, upgrade slash downgrade to your to your quote unquote gun. And you know you got your gun at the beginning of the game, and it shoots these little like little green things. And there was eight different levels of the gun, and there were there were two levels of the gun that were kind of really annoying to use because they shot like bowling balls. <laughs> like literal bowling balls like they shot bowling balls but they would move in this kind of spiral fashion and against the borders of some things like buildings and and tree lines and stuff if it made contact with it it would just stop the shot so if you didn't have a kind of a a, a clear shot in front of you you couldn't hit anything so your shot would stop literally in front of you and by the time you got the best weapon you could kill anything within a shot or two but the always annoying thing was an enemy has the potential to drop an item that downgrades your gun. So you could have the best thing and still lose it. But when you get to the end of an area, you have to fight an alien boss. And when you and the only way to access this is if you've killed an enemy and he drops a key that lets you access the building in which the boss is hiding. And they were always these like hospital-looking buildings, white buildings with uh, kind of uh, no trim or anything like that. But once you go inside them, it kind of turns into a. Did it? Did any of you ever play like any of the old like wizardry or fantasy star games where you would go into the dungeons and it would be you would kind of move forward and it would kind of have that kind of three D effect of you would kind oh, of see yeah. off at the distance. So this had that, and this was an NES game in the late 80s that did it. So it was kind of, you know, it was kind of cool for the time, 
but uh, you would have to navigate your way through a maze inside of a building to a door, and the door would either kick you back outside or you would face the boss. And these bosses were always kind of ridiculously hard if you didn't have an upgraded enough gun. And um, at the beginning of the game, you have two hit points. And I think you could max out at about four or so, depending on what you did throughout the game. Mm -hmm. Because uh, outside of going into these buildings, there were other houses that you could go to. And the other houses, if you had the keys, you would access them, and it would be one of the Adams family members, and they would give you a special item. Like, Wednesday would give you something called a vice, because specific enemies would hit you, and it would slow you down, and you would be in kind of permanent slow motion moving until you used this item. And if you didn't have that item, you were kind of SOL until you could find a house that gave you that item. So, you know, you had Wednesday, Pugsley, you had Thing, you had, you know, Grandmama, Morticia. I don't think Gomez ever actually gave you anything. But basically every, all of the other, like, supporting characters for the Adams Family showed up in just that fashion. <laughs> um, the game was absolutely brutal with these uh, bosses, too, because these bosses would take some 40, 50, 60 hits to take down, and they only had to hit you twice. But it's an Adam's Family game. It has to be good, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're NES games. They have to be good, right? The, the, the really cool thing about it is while this game I mean, game E.T. Is... was an amazing movie. Of course it had to be right. an amazing it's game, exactly, right? Yeah, it's exactly. a great Atari game. It's wonderful. Another really cool thing about the about this game is that while, you know, the game itself is kind of nothing to write home about, it's just kind of fun to play if you like, you know, Adam's Family stuff. The soundtrack is actually really good for it. Like, if you ever just kind of go to YouTube and, and search any of the Fester's Quest music, it it pushed the uh, the sound chip for the NES to its absolute limits, and it has some really good songs on it. Nice. It's all about how you take advantage of the software, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, it, it's the crazy thing, too, because the team that did it was the same team that made Blaster Master. Yeah, that, and, that is know, probably one of the other five action games I've ever beaten in my life. And it's crazy, I, too, I because, like that. you know, the the the, um, the developer, the, the guy that came up for this game was working with the Japanese um, side of Sunsoft for this. And Japanese people at, in, you know, the late 80s had no concept of what the Adams family was. So he's trying <laughs> to explain the humor to them and he's trying to explain everything about it. And they were just like, we don't get it. <laughs> so they were, you know, they had a lot of back and forth and poor communication, and that's more more or less why this game turned out the way it did. But if you do play it, I guarantee you within the first, like, five or ten minutes of playing it, you'll go, well, this plays like Blaster Master. Hmm. Hmm. I'll take your word for it. I've never played that game, I'm afraid. Most people haven't, and then the people who have would probably choose to forget it. Well, that's not the one where you play as, like, this little tank thing, is it? No. no, or that's not that one. No, Bla are you, you're talking about Blaster Master. Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. Yes, that you know because they did they did the two new Blaster Master games in the last few years on you know modern consoles, yeah. and it's it's basically like that. But there are those little like um, third person sections, the top down sections. That's how that's how Fester's Quest essentially plays. Okay. All right. All right. Well, moving on from uh, the Adams family to a more video game centric family uh yangus go ahead let's talk super mario brothers all right so i picked super mario brothers 3 for my game or for one of my games and super mario brothers 3 is kind of an interesting game because when it was originally uh, first revealed to the public it was actually through a movie that nintendo had helped make called the wizard it's an old movie that stars fred savage and he and his little brother are trying to get to california to get to this big video game um i think it's a competition if i remember right and like all the like the little brother is really good at playing through games. He gets high scores on all of this stuff that they have at their house. And when he gets to the competition, it's between the little brother, this other kid named Lucas who keeps showing up through the movie and this third character that only appears for that at that point in the movie. But the big reveal for the game that they're playing is Super Mario Brothers 3. And if I remember right, that's the very first time it was ever revealed to the public for people yeah. to like find out about that game. Yeah, I remember, so it was a really I remember big when deal. all that happened. Like, it's, it's so bad. 
<laughs> I love the power glove. It's so bad. <laughs> that's, that's one of my favorite quotes from that wizard movie. Um, but anyway, so Super Mario Brothers 3, it was kind of, I think it was kind of towards the end of the NES life cycle, if I remember right. Or ni- it's from 1998, I believe. Or 1988, excuse me. It's really late. It was ni- I know, I was going to say it's really late if it's 98. But um, no, it's from uh, 1988, and it was one of the big Mario games that really kind of changed up how Mario games would uh, be in the future. So, first thing that's kind of cool about the game is when you start it up, it had actually uh, treats the game kind of like it's almost like a stage play, in a way. Because when you start the game up, uh, there's a big red curtain that slowly rises up. Mario and Luigi come running off from stage left and stage right. They jump up, you get your uh, title logo then, and then you see a bunch of props <laughs> fall down onto the stage that are like different items from the game, like a mushroom, you have a Koopa shell, a Buzzy Beetle, and all sorts of stuff. And you see Mario and Luigi kind of fighting each other with the items that drop from the ceiling. It's huh. kind of just up to interpretation if it actually is supposed to be a stage play, but that's just kind of one fun little fan theory that people have, only because the game kind of presents itself that way, and there's set pieces in the background that look thought- like giant blocks put together by screws, and there's just little wooden blocks and donut blocks and just things like that. I thought Miyamoto had confirmed that. Oh, did he? I thought he did. Uh, I, mean, well, I mean, internet and everything, but I yeah. thought he had. Well, Miyamoto's also gone back and forth on whether the Koopalings are Bowser's kids or not, so I, I don't know how much I trust of what he says, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, anyway, so Super Mario Bros. 3, uh, like I said, it really started to bring a lot of first to the Mario series. Like, with Mario 1 and Mario 2... It was mainly just you went from level to level, like you beat the level, you go straight into the next one, and so on and so forth until you clear the game. But with Mario Brothers 3, they actually introduced world maps for every area. So with World 1, it's like the grasslands, World 2 is Desert Hill, World 3 is the uh, seaside, things like that. And you actually could choose, in some cases, what levels you wanted to go to. So... Like in World 1, for example, you beat the first world in the, or the, set, the first level and the second level. Well, then you can choose to actually go over to the left, or, or to the right, excuse me, and choose uh, level 1-3. You can go down and go to level 1-4, or you can totally skip those levels entirely and go straight to the first fortress of that, um, of that world map. So then you can go right towards the castle and help the king that's in there. So it was kind of cool how a lot of the maps let you choose your own route that you wanted to go. And there were different obstacles that you'd have to get across, like, there's always um, roaming uh, Hammer Brothers or Boomerang Brothers, or in some cases, the rarely seen, like, Fire Brother, where they look like a Koopa Troopa that's all decked out in in higher gear armor, and will usually throw weapon, you know, they'll throw hammers, boomerangs, they'll spit fireballs at you, just depends on which ones you come across. And you actually had to beat them in order to progress because if you lost to them, you get be- you kicked back to the last level that uh, you had beaten. Because every time you beat a level, it treats that level that you just beat as a checkpoint for you. So uh, in some cases, if you get to the end of a world and you get to the, di- the giant airship that one of the Koopalings is on, if you can't beat the Koopaling, the airship will fly off somewhere else onto the world map and you have to go chase it down. So you have to, if you're lucky, you can beat a level and you get a checkpoint a little closer to the ship for where it flew off to. Or if you find a Hammer Brother, you can run into them, beat them up, and then that creates another checkpoint for you. So that way then there's kind of a, a sort of a safety net almost for you so you don't have to like trope through the entire level again just to, or the entire world again just to get back to wherever the boss might happen to end up at on the airship if they escape. Um, but let's see. There's This is also the first Mario game that actually had a pretty cool inventory system. So with the world map, there were a lot of different things that were scattered on the, f- on the floor, or on the um, world maps. And uh, with the world maps, there were different toad houses you could go to. Uh, there's little, they look like spades on the map where if you click on them, you can end up playing mini games. And get different items, or you can get a lot of one-ups for them. So if you stop at the Toad Houses, you can pick out one of three chests, and whatever chest you get, you might get a mushroom, a fire flower, a special outfit for Mario to wear that gives him power-ups. Or if you can end up collecting enough coins in, in specific levels, like um, one four, for example, if you get enough coins in that one, I believe it's like forty-five. You can actually get a special blue Toad House to appear, which will give you a unique item like the like the limited P wings, or it will give you an anchor. So if the ships 
do end up escaping from you if you can't beat the coupling in it. You can actually use the anchor and keep them stationed so they can't run away from you anymore if you happen to die on the ship again. And um, uh, something else I just mentioned is they did... This was also the first Mario game that introduced uh, power-up costumes for Mario to use in his adventure. So, like, this game introduced the frog suit, uh, the tanuki suit, and the Hammer Brothers suit. And you haven't seen... The, that frog suit hasn't really appeared ever again, and the Hammer Brothers suit has kind of made a return, I think, in the Mario Maker games, mainly as a helmet to protect Mario from fireballs and stuff. But the Tanuki suit is probably one of the more infamous ones because it lets Mario turn into a stone statue, for one. It lets him fly around. It's kind of like an upgraded version of the regular Raccoon Mario power-up from Mario Brothers 3. And with the Tanuki suit, it's appeared in a lot of other Mario games. Like, it made its big return in um, Super Mario 3D Land on the 3DS, he was featured as a as an alternate version of Mario you could play as in Mario Kart 8. And uh, usually if in the newer games too, like Luigi will get that costume as well. But his is based on a, a Kitsune or whatever that, the like the Fox equivalent to, a, or what like the Fox opposite is of a, a Tanuki. I believe it's a Kitsune if I remember right. Um, let's see. So this game did have a lot of secrets to it. And there's still a lot that people still find out today. So with Mario 3, there's a lot of alternate routes, like I said, you can take. And through those, it's not just on the world map, but it's also in specific levels that you play. Like um, in World 1, I know I keep using that as my main example, but in World 1, there's the, the first fortress that you go to. You can keep going straight right and go right and fight the boss boom boom at the end and you just beat the fortress and you're good to go but there's also an alternate way you can go to beat the fortress if you have um a p-wing or if you have a um, a leaf so you're a raccoon mario you can actually fly up above where the door is that would lead you towards boom boom uh in the first like hallway chamber like it's the very first room of the castle you can actually fly up above and walk above the ceiling screen and you end up going into a special doorway which leads you to this special little um flute uh the special little flute that you can find and if you play the flute you actually can go to the warp zone which unlike um mario one where it was just hidden away at the end of a level the warp zone will actually let you skip ahead uh, to different worlds depending on how many you have. So if you had two warp whistles, for instance, you could use the first warp whistle and it lets you pick between worlds two, three, and four. But if you used another warp whistle that you happen to find, you could actually go straight to world eight. So you could beat the game really fast if you were you know, confident enough in your skills and you felt like you could handle the challenge of world eight immediately with only a few lives and just a few power-ups under your belt from world one and two. Um, let me see. All I so, remember is going to world i think it was world seven all the time the place you could get almost the infinite coins oh one, there was one there that Sorry, yeah you hit the switch and like literally the whole screen just turned into coins oh i know what Fort i know what fortress you're talking about yeah i believe that's in world seven i think yep. at the halfway point of that one yeah i remember doing that and just i'd always go there get myself all the lives yeah. save myself one p-wing for that stupid flying thing somewhere in world eight yeah that, <laughs> the one I know that exactly automatically what, scrolled. I know exactly which one you're talking about. That's yep. one of the things about this game that I really like. Super Mario Brothers Three is one of the Mario games that I do. I, I feel like I know the best. Besides, um, like Super Mario World would probably be my one game that I know better more than any other game. And Super Mario Brothers Three is one of the Mario games I know a little bit better too. But when you get to, like to World Seven and Eight, that's when the game just pretty much takes off the kitty gloves and is like, okay, you know what? You've gotten this far. We're not going to be nice anymore. Because with World 7, I have a, a story about that one. So my first introduction to Mario 3 was through the Super Mario All-Stars pack on the Super Nintendo. And I mainly got to play it at a cousin's house who had a Super Nintendo. And he was old enough, he just left it there and didn't really mind if anybody played on it. So I would just pop in the Mario All-Stars pack and would just play the different games. Well, I had found one of the Warp Whistles one time in World 2, I believe. It's on, like, the far eastern side of the desert past a rock that you can break open with a hammer. And if you beat the Fire Bro there, you can get a whistle. And I ended up using the whistle, and I warped World 7, because as a kid, I'm like, oh, well, you know, if I want to get as far through the game as I can, so I'm just going to go straight to World 7. I To this day, World 7, the pipe maze in Mario Brothers 3, is still one of my least favorite world ex or like le world slash level <laughs> slash whatever you want to call it experiences in a video game like it's to me it's mo as notorious as something like rusty bucket bay is from banjo kazooie on the nintendo 64 it's just ridiculous 
ridiculous what they want from you and when you get to that point of the game. There were so many times, Matt, that or uh, Platty, excuse me, that I could not get past World 7-1. I just could not beat it. I never could. I would run out of lives and keep getting game over, and I just would be stuck on World 7. I couldn't get anywhere else. It's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. It's... <laughs> now, I had a guidebook for this game that Nintendo Power put out. I remember it. It gave you a complete walkthrough. It showed all the maps. It had all the hints in it. Um, I remember that, how... yeah. Yeah, it had all the houses with the matching tiles, like, there were only eight possible ways, and if you, like, turned over two or three tiles, you knew exactly which map it was. So I'd every time I played this and beat it, it would always start with, you know, I'd go through, like, World 1 or 2, I'd get a couple warp whistles. I think I would mainly go through 1 and 2, build up a lot of items like that. Um, like you said, you had to have a certain number of warp whistles to get a certain place. I'd always warp to World 7, build myself up with uh, 100 lives or so at that one place, and then go take on World 8. So I, I I definitely had a playthrough style for this, and it relied heavily on using that map. Oh man, yeah, that it sounds like you definitely had a good strategy for it. I was like, oh god, I think it was like eight or nine when I first played the game, and I didn't have a whole lot of experiences with the early Mario games at that point, so I didn't quite expect it to be quite that difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I definitely wish, like, when the Game Boy Advance version of um, Super Mario Bros. 3 came out, it was Super Mario Advance 4, uh, to be precise. Like, I got that game, and I got the guidebook for it, like, the official one from Nintendo Power. And I remember when I finally got to World 7, I basically had that thing glued to my lap and was slowly, like, inching my way through that world. So that's because I did not want to have, like... You know, get stuck for like I had like a few years before when I played the Super Nintendo version. <laughs> now I can beat it like okay ish. I still kind of cringe up when I get to that world. It's just like, oh man, I don't want to have to do this one again. But <laughs> it, it, Super Mario Brothers Three is definitely a game that I feel does a pretty good job by like gradually increasing the difficulty. But when you get, like, just past World 6, and that's when the game just, like, all of a sudden, like, spikes up the hill as hard as it can for you. Because World 7 and 8 are just, they can be nasty. They like, are. even compared to some other Mario games, they can be really nasty. Brutal. I'm guessing by the way you guys have talked about it, too. How many of you guys have played, like, any version of Super Mario Bros. 3? I've played all of them. Whatever version exists, I've played it. Nice. I, I played it back in the day, and I've shown my son it. We were playing it. Is it on the Virtual Console for the uh, Switch? Um, yeah, it's on the NES um, okay. online then, thing, whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've played that. Okay. Um, what do you guys think? You know, just so I take a quick break from my notes, but what were you guys... What, what do you guys think about that game as a whole? Like, did you like it when you played it for the first time? Or oh, yeah. Was it something used... that's, like, super difficult for you? Like, what you know, what are your general opinions on it? It was definitely more difficult because I didn't like uh, Super Mario Brothers two because it was a very it was a very different game from the first one mm -hmm. you know because that was when I when when I got my NES in the late eighties early nineties mm -hmm. you know it came with Super Mario Brothers and I played that constantly because I was a young child and I never owned Super Mario Brothers two but I had a neighbor who did so he would always come over and bring his copy and we would play it but I never liked it as much and then three was kind of this kind of holy grail game because it was very different from the second one but it reminded me a lot of the first one but you know the whole map functions of the game made it uh very enjoyable especially once we figured out because when we were playing in the early 90s uh you know game facts didn't exist everything if you didn't have a magazine subscription was impossible to find so a lot of that stuff was very hearsay of oh hey I heard if you go to this stage and do this thing, you get a whistle. Oh, let's try that out. And, you know, we would try our hand at it for days to a week to try and mm -hmm. do it mm -hmm. and, and get it. So when we figured that stuff out, it was, you know, everybody was excited about it. And it just kind of made it a very communal experience for the neighborhood kids, basically, because we'd all, you know, group up and, and play the game at someone's house. And uh, I've always enjoyed Super Mario Brothers 3 the most. I think it's probably my favorite of the first three games. And I remember Definitely. when yep. and I remember when Super Mario World would, had been announced, I guess, around that year. Because we were all like, is it going to be an NES game? Is it going to be a Super Nintendo game? I, You know, Super Mario Brothers 4, Super Mario Brothers World. There was a lot of, you know, 
kid discussion going on there about it. Oh, that's cool. That's cool to hear about stories like that, too. I like hearing stuff like that. So I was very convinced that it, myself that it was going to come out on the NES because why would they put it out on a new system where people couldn't play it, you know, before you realize, oh, they're trying to sell a product. Yeah, this is this is one I had back in the day. I didn't have all that many games. When I actually bought an NES, it was... I. One of my friends sold it to me with ten games, and I want to say my parents gave me a hundred dollars for like my birthday to get it because he had gotten maybe he got a Sega or something for that for Christmas, and came back from spring or Christmas break, and my birthday's in January, so my parents never knew what to get me for my birthday because it was like, well, Christmas was just over. You got the couple big things you wanted. There was like, uh, what do you want for your birthday? Anything? And I was like, oh, my friend just got this. He wants to get rid of his Nintendo. Can I buy it from him? And Honestly, I think I bought it from him with 10 games and didn't get much else, but I got that. That and Robin Hood are two of the ones I remember. <laughs> I never actually owned a copy of Super Mario Brothers 3 until probably 2001, 2002, when a friend in high school was getting rid of his NES, and he just kind of gave me his copy. Because we always cool. played, we always played the neighbor's copy, and then he moved away, so I no longer had access to it from, you know, ninety one, ninety two until ten years later, just about. Because hmm. I didn't have Super Mario All Stars. I think it was on the Super Nintendo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, that was um, on the Super Nintendo. I didn't have that one. No friends had it because. All of the friends I had went to the PlayStation route because most people went from the NES to the PlayStation. A lot of people skipped the NES or the Super Nintendo. So that was my personal experience with it. I didn't even have a Super Nintendo myself until almost 2000. So, yeah. so you're oh, saying wow. your friends all went to the dark side is what you're talking? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. It was when, when it, you know 1996 rolled around, and then a lot of my friends were RPG kind of guys because they enjoyed. Final Fantasy and Dragon yeah. Quest, and then Final Fantasy VII was coming to the PlayStation One, and yeah. a lot of them wanted in on that action. So, but that's you know a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm just totally kidding too. So <laughs> I just had to, I just had to throw that in there real quick just because it popped in my head. <laughs> well, on the topic of other discussion, is that about it for uh, Mario Three, Angus? We'll move on. Uh, um. I just want to say what, real one more thing, just real quick. If you ever do want to try and play the game, and even though nobody really plays on the console anymore, there is actually a really good port of Super Mario Brothers Three. Uh, it's based on the Game Boy Advance version that's available on the Wii U's Virtual Console, and I specifically point to that one because it actually adds in a lot of the stuff that originally. So with the Game Boy Advance back in the day, they tried Nintendo tried pushing this. Um, e-card reader system for it and when super mario brothers 3 came out for the game boy advance there were actually a lot of cards that would give you special power-ups like you could access brand new levels that were brand new to the game entirely with new challenges and stuff but for some reason they didn't put that in the base game like as a secret unlockable you had to have the cards with the virtual mm -hmm. console release on the wii u you could actually access all of that stuff from the get-go like they purposely included all of that e-card stuff right away so you could just access it without any you know hassle yeah. or anything like that I, I bought that version specifically because in the retail release there so with the way that the e-cards worked is that you go to this alternate map and you could scan the cards and you could save the levels to the cards but there was only you know for for just the purpose of you could only save 10 levels at a time right but there were 30 cards that would give you 30 levels Mm -hmm. On the in the Wii U Virtual Console release, Nintendo kind of edited the game so that they could put everything in the release. Yes, yeah, so I'm did. glad that they did that too because it's I I didn't really buy a lot of the Game Boy Advance games since I already had a lot of them, but I did buy that one specifically for that because I never got to experience that content either. But you know, even if you don't play the Super or the Game Boy Advance remake, if you play like the Super Nintendo one on the All Stars Pack or the original NES one, however you can, like Super Mario Brothers Three is really a good game. Whether you're a Mario fan or just a fan of platformers or just looking for a good NES title to play, it's you can't go wrong on any system you play it on because it's a very well made game from start to finish, and there's a lot of great things that are introduced into that game that have stayed with the Mario series over the years, and it's been cool seeing that like as the older I've gotten, like how much Mario Three has played an influence on the series too. So definitely one worth checking out if you've never played Mario Three or if you've never played 
um, the game before in any form or capacity. Um, Brian, we'll go back to you. Uh, you had another game that I've never heard of, um, and I had to ask you to say it a couple times. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, like, so it's, game about it's, buying. It's a you're, game you're about, about Boulder Dash. Boulder Boulder Dash. Boulder Boulder. Dash. It's Boulder, Boulder, not Balder. Boulder Dash. Yeah. So it's uh, it's another one of those interesting games. Um, Well, to me, interesting. I imported a Famicom copy of this a long time ago because I could never find a... This game actually did get released over here in North America, but it's, for whatever reason, hard. It was hard when I was looking for a copy to find a copy. But, um... We'll we'll kind of we'll kind of backtrack a little bit. It was a um, it's a 2D puzzle game that was released in 1984 for old eight, Atari 8-bit eight computers. Um, it's been ported to just about everything under the sun up until about the NES. Actually, it was even put on the Game Boy Advance, I believe. Wow. But, um, you know, it started out on the Atari 8-bit. There was an arcade release. It was on the, the Commodore 64 version was probably the most popular version of this game. Um, it was also on such other popular consoles as the Acorn Electron, the yeah. Amstrad CPC, Whoops. the, the <laughs> Intellivision. Um, that one at least I've heard of. <laughs> what on earth is the yeah. Acorn? I've never heard of that one before. <laughs> Oh man, that system's nuts. You, you should give it a shot sometime. Um, Sounds kind of nutty. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, go on. <laughs> so, Boulder Dash is... Um, did, did we lose Did we lose everybody again? Oh, uh, my mic muted itself. I was talking for about 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Okay. Um, Been there? So, so, Boulder Dash is, like I said, it's been around forever. It was, it was created by um, two Canadian dudes back in the early 80s, right? Um, the NES version was probably my favorite version of it just because of, you know, how it looked. Um, I think I'm having problems with my microphone. Yeah, did you, you've, cut, you've cut out a few times on my end. No, I can't hear him at all. Are you still there, Matt? Are you still there, Platty? Yeah, I am. Okay. Hello, I am back. Can you hear me now? Yay! Yeah, there yes, he is. Can. All right, cool. Um, all right, so let me let me let me dial back thirty seconds now. Um, so, sure, like sure, I said sure, before, sure. sure, sure, sure. Boulder Dash, uh, like I said earlier, was probably most popular on the Commodore sixty four and probably the Atari four hundred and eight hundred series. Um, consoles, which are like I, th I think those were tape-based consoles, so you had to always kind of type in what you were um, you, the code for the games to get everything. So, more or less, this game is a, like I said, it's a, it's a 2D puzzler, as um, and you essentially are this little this this little dude called Rockford, right? And you're inside mm -hmm. these caves to collect diamonds. Diamonds are the whole point of your existence. You want to complete the puzzle by collecting as many diamonds as possible. Um, the terrain is generally shown in kind of a cross-section with uh, multi-directional screens that slide and consists of um, an invisible grid of boxes that can be occupied by the ground, other items, you, so on and, and so forth. So um, you're kind of digging your way through each stage. Um, in, in the original game, it was just kind of a you can you complete level after subsequent level but on the nes version they kind of give it a graphical overhaul they made it a lot more appealing they kind of give it kind of give it a kind of uh super mario brothers uh overworld kind of view to it of you're moving between levels as you complete each level so after you finish one level you move to the next dot on the overworld and you finish sections and you move forward and onward. And I think there were five or seven different uh, total worlds with uh, a bunch of different maps inside of it. I forget how many different levels there were on the NES version compared to uh, other versions because it varied between the versions of the games based on the hardware of the system. Um, you, can, you can dig tunnels in the four directions and um, you have to kind of pay attention to what's going on around you because as you dig, 
there are boulders and there are diamonds and you want to collect the diamonds without having the boulders fall on you and crush you but you kind of have to dig to lead the boulders to fall in certain ways so that either a you don't get hit b they don't connect with each other and explode and take you out with it and collect all the diamonds and once you collect um, all the diamonds on a level early on you, you don't need to get all of them but you need to get a certain amount of the diamonds to open the exit up to the level so that you can progress and move on and that's more or less the gist of the whole game it's a very simple game but it's kind of got very driving gameplay value to it like you can just turn it on and go mm-hmm. um, oh, nice. I'm going to assume that neither of you have ever heard of or played this game no i'm afraid not i've never heard of this one before and that's nope. why i wanted to bring it up because it was one of it's one of those very it's been on a ton of systems like as i have been talking i kind of pulled up what systems it's been on mm-hmm. there's even a version of it on the 3ds oh really i didn't even know that much i was gonna say hmm. with um you talking about the game boy advance version was that like a remake of it or was that just like a straight port of one of the original versions do you know at all so more or less every version of the game is a port of the previous version, but there's also, I, you know, I pulled up the Wikipedia page here. There's about 20 different entries here. You've got Boulder Dash. You've got the second game. There's a third game. Um, there's a part two. There's uh, actually there's 10 entries for this Boulder for Boulder Dash that are just kind of um, extrapolations on the original game. I mean, like I said, it's it's a concept and you can just kind of build on it. So. Did you ever play Splunker on the NES? Mm-mm. That's not familiar. I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna you say that little, you. I'm, I'm gonna say that hat? you've heard of it, but probably have never played it. But yes, it's the yellow hat one. Okay. It's kind okay, of like yeah, that. It's, about it's, that, it's yeah. kind of like that. That game has had a dozen different re-releases, and they're all kind of different, but they're all the same kind of game. Okay. Like it's just a puzzle game to where you're trying to figure out what you need to do to progress to the end of the level. But in Boulder Dash, it's just collect all the diamonds. You know, as you progress, there will be enemies in the level um, and you can manipulate the, the falling rocks to trap the enemies so that you can get to the diamonds to um, finish the level. So I don't know how much more I can say on that because <laughs> it's a very simple concept, but you can do a lot with it. I was going to say, it sounds like it'd be a fun time to have. In, in just, fact, they just released a 30th anniversary version a few years ago on the PC. <laughs> so <laughs> it's got a lot of history to it, even though the majority of people probably have never played it. But I would suggest it. The NES version is a lot of fun. It's got that kind of Japanese platformer charm to it. Mm-hmm. Compared to, if you look at the Commodore 64 version and you look at the NES version, it looks doesn't even look like the same game. Alrighty. Well, we will move on from puzzles to a totally different genre. Um, I'm going to talk about a game that if uh, Pendy was here, he would go on and on and on about with me about this one. Um, Sports game, Tecmo Super Bowl. Uh, I know nowadays everybody plays Madden. That that's the go-to football series, the go-to football game. But uh, I think the first one that did it really awesome was Tecmo Super Bowl. And looking this up, just to give a little bit of credibility to my statement there, um, in 1997, it got a couple publications, gave this thing one of the top 100 video games of all time. Uh, ESPN had a tournament to determine the greatest sports video game of all time a few years back, and this one won. This was the number one in its uh, battle royale. I think they did like a 64 game kind of thing, and this game won. Um, they have, uh, to this day, there are, there's a group that takes the old ROM and updates it with modern day team rosters and puts in the stats and you can buy repo carts with all the new stats. They, they're, they're incredibly expensive. I want to say they're like 60, 70, 80 bucks to get it updated. Um, they run tournaments still with this game. Um, it was on ESPN.com back in 2016. They had their big one. I know, uh, Madison, Wisconsin is one of the places annual world championship but pendy played the he he was the two-time defending korean champion in this game you know take that as you will shout out to you pendy but uh i don't know how many people he was competing against that were actually playing this game uh 
25 years after its release. But it, it was a full-featured game that you'd almost expect to have nowadays, like modern. It had all 30 teams on it. Um, it had the full roster, backups, and everybody. It had all their stats. Um, you could play the regular season. You, it would start with, a, if you did, like, the franchise mode, you would do a preseason. You'd have a regular season. Um, it kept stats week to week. You could check in on, like, rushing leaders and passing leaders and passing percentage leaders and everything. You could check in on your team stats week to week. Um, they even had auto modes where if you just wanted to call the plays and watch the computer do it, you could just call the plays. You could take control of it like 99% of other sports games. Um, it it was just great. It scrolled left to right, and you saw it from the left-right perspective, whereas Madden these days, you've got the view from behind the player. I, I just loved all the statistics it kept. I love video games with statistics, and this one would be like, okay, I'm going to really try to get my running back to be the number one running back. Or there was like a wide receiver that like I only had certain routes that he would run, because you were limited to four offensive and four um, defensive plays that you could do. And actually, the defensive plays were just trying to guess what the offense was doing. So you had a 25% chance every time the person would be picking a play and you'd pick the same one and it would just lead to a sack or a no, your, no gain or anything. But if you could really... I always loved setting it up. So that, like, I would have one passing play that was, like, really short routes, one passing play that was really long routes, and then, like, tiny runs. And I would just run. And then, like, the AI was not exactly incredibly smart here. So, you know, you could set it from the beginning and just see your guy going down the field and, you know, hit 70-yard bombs on every play sometimes. But, yeah, there, I'd, I'd always have, like, a player or two that I'd be like, yeah, by the end of the year, I want him to have the highest receiving yards per catch total in the league. And just playing around with that because it, you, you played this thing for years and years and years, and it, the challenge was not in beating the AI. It was almost racking up the stats. And they'd have playoffs. They had the Super Bowl. Um, they even had a Pro Bowl for the players that finished best every year. Uh, it, it was pretty just hilarious the the sound effects the they had halftime shows at the super bowl and i want to see like almost every year during the super bowl looking on twitter somebody's posting the super bowl halftime show from tecmo super bowl and i think they funny. were yeah i mean so everybody's like all right it's time you know here we are tecmo super bowl uh, i can't i want to say ah, gosh and i've seen their names so many times with those little guys. Oh, the Mighty Bomber Jacks. These little guys would just come out and put on a little show. Um, is it a sequel to Tecmo Bowl Planet? Play because, um, yes. Like, okay, so, okay, because on the uh, NES uh, app thing that uh, Nintendo has for the Switch, there mm -hmm. is a Tecmo Bowl game for it, but it's, it's just called Tecmo Bowl, not like Tecmo Super Bowl. Yep, Tecmo Bowl, I want to say, was maybe like 7-on-7 seven seven or 9-on-9, nine nine, and I remember playing that in the arcades before I ever got it for Nintendo. And the whole point is, like, your guy would go to get tackled, but if they didn't dive, you just see them, like, grab each other's shoulders head-to-head. -head. And if you could smash the button fast enough, the other guy would just get flung off. And Tecmo Super Bowl kept that up. They made the players a little smaller. The first one was definitely cartoonishly sized. Big muscle guys, and you just plow through them. But the second game, too, this Tecmo Super Bowl... It'd be great. You would just, you'd pick somebody, you'd immediately lock up with somebody else, and if you could press the button fast enough, you'd see the other player just go flying, and then you'd be free to go do what you need to do. Hmm. And they just, they had players that had such stats that it just, it kind of broke the game. If you were uh, Bo Jackson, I mean, this was made during like the two or three years that he actually played football, but he had the highest speed stat in the game, and you could just run away from everybody. <laughs> But That's pretty yeah, funny. yeah, I I think one of my favorite moments ever. They always had the anytime you completed a pass, um, they showed the quarterback celebrating, and they showed the guy running with the ball, flying in the air, running in the end zone with it, and they'd be like, have the quarterback name, have the running back, or the guy who caught its name, and they'd always have these little scripted, um, you know, two three second little shots. Well, one time I threw a pass, and I loved being the Buccaneers, my Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They sucked back then as they have for the past 10 years. But uh, I had Vinny Testaverde at quarterback, and I threw the ball, and it got batted, and it came back, and he caught it. 
Like, I didn't even know this was possible. Or, oh no, he didn't catch it. If the guy caught it, but the ball fumbled, and I was still controlling the quarterback, and I picked it up and ran it in. So I distinctly remember that day just cracking up, watching, like, the little cut scene of that guy celebrating for throwing it, and then the same guy, like, it looked like he had caught the ball because, you know, it was just a programming thing. <laughs> Whatever player crossed the goal line was the one in the cutscene, and whoever threw the ball was the one in the cutscene, but it was the same guy in both cutscenes. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he can help himself out that well. <laughs> yeah, like, it was like, yeah, he, he caught it, and you know, he scored the touchdown and threw the touchdown, you know? That's hilarious. You know, while I never did play this game when it was on the NES, I gave it a shot when it came to the Wii Virtual mm-hmm. Console, and uh, they didn't have the rights to any of the names for any of oh. the players from that game so everything got stripped out and it became just number 23 number 17 yeah which... there were actually a couple people that didn't give their names their the permission randall cunningham was the quarterback of the eagles back then and i can't remember what he was like number seven or something and so for the eagles a little black sprite is there but he's like qb number seven yeah that's it and that was basically the entirety of the oh. re-release when it came to the Wii Virtual Console because e- at this point, EA has the NFL license, mm-hmm. so they couldn't mm-hmm. acquire any of that stuff, so they had to take all of the names out. <laughs> so oh, it, becomes, it becomes a very generic, nondescript football game of no more Bo Jackson scoring that touchdown. It's, you know... RB20 tw- or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that stinks. That's too bad. It does sound, though, like this Tecmo Super Bowl was really a big improvement over the first game. Like, they took what worked and just really fine-tuned everything. Cause it, it, I'm not really big on football, but i, I got to admit, this game does sound like it'd be pretty fun to play. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, it's, like I said, it's before Madden. I, I, I want to say, like, Madden, I have, like, Madden 92, Madden 96 or something like that, I remember. Was, for like was Super 92? Nintendo. Did it really go as far back as 92? I thought 93 or 94 was the first Madden. Okay, so it may be then. So, but, and this soup, this came out December um, 91, so it didn't beat it by much. But, I mean, this having, like, like, the features this has are what pretty much every Madden going forward have. You got the full season. You got the preseason. You've got all the backups in there. Everybody's got all the ratings, and they get tired during the game. They could get injured and hauled off on a cart. Uh, I can't remember if it had a ambulance thing or not, if this was the one with that, but it, I mean, it had everything that you go fast forward 5, 10, 15 years in the future, and it's got all those gameplay things. Whereas Tech Mobile was like, you just put in quarters in the machine, and you pick the team, and you were playing 7 on 7 at half. It was half beat em up half football. They did uh, they did keep it, but yeah, the uh, all Wait, the print outs. Wait, was that... An- you know what that reminds me of is NFL Blitz. Did you ever play that? I did. Yeah, that uh, was... Uh... <laughs> That's definitely a beat em up football game. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did look it up in Madden. John Madden football has been around since 1988. So what? Oh, wow. Well, PC it started on. It started on the PC. Wow. Oh, wow. That's I had no clue. Time. That is a long Apple, time. Apple two. Apple two. MS DOS and Commodore 64. Is it on that Acorn thing too? Is it Acorn? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so yeah, I, I, my favorite team, other than the Buccaneers, I used to play uh, the Houston Oilers. Um, that that was one of my favorites, and it was great because they had four great wide receivers back then. They ran the run and shoot offense and would pass, you know, seventy percent of the time. And I loved doing that. And they had a, one of the uh, their one running back. I think his last name was White at the time, and he wasn't the speediest guy, but he was one of the ones that. His uh, like break tackle stat was really high, so you could just like just be tapping a like crazy and running, and defenders would literally just bounce right off you, go flying. Not, not James White. Was that it? God, he was a we, wait, he, the he running, back, running for the, back for the Oilers. The, the, oh no, that he was the James White was a running back for the Patriots. Yeah, yeah. This is this is, goes back quite a ways, but it turns out like I didn't know it at the time, but I really liked the wide receivers for Houston and. Gosh, to this day, I can tell you there was like a guy named Hall, Givens, oh, Lorenzo White. Lorenzo, there you go. That's a cool name, Lorenzo White. I like the sound of it. But turned out one of the wide receivers from the game that was playing with Houston at the time, and one of my favorite quarterbacks growing up was Warren Moon. Um, that guy went to my high school, and I think towards the end of my high school career, um, he came back and was like teaching him and his wife or him and his sister were teaching the track team. 
after he retired from the NFL. And I was like, oh, yeah, I used to I used to play with you on Tecmo Super Bowl all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now you're teaching high school track. But so not much other praise to give this. But this is a game that's surprisingly still around. You you Google it. And like I said, they there's groups out there that are updating the rosters every year and as, selling as, yeah, parts with it. Who was that? There was yeah, I was actually reading one of those kind of long reads articles about a month ago um, of a group of guys who still to this day I don't think they do the NCAA any games anymore. Mm -hmm. But these guys basically do what you're describing is every year they update the roster and they release a, a mod patch that patches the last retail release of NCAA football to put in all of the new players and it's like that is dedication if I've ever seen any. That is pretty cool. You gotta I've like never one seen it, but apparently like this one has that too. There are mods for this game that people will put in college teams and players and change up the colors and whatnot. I wonder if they've done one for the University of Iowa. I bet they have. If they do college if, teams. If if uh, NCAA probably Probably, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's cool, though, that there's a big dedicated fandom to it, too, like constantly updating it and putting in the rosters and every like the current rosters. That's really cool. It, it makes me wonder, like, you know, they're obviously skirting on copyright. They, they, they got to be. And especially if they're putting players' names in, like. Oh, absolutely. Like, mm -hmm. like and they're sell I mean, they're selling these things for quite good money. So wait, they're actually selling it. Oh, yeah. Tecmo. Super Bowl, like 2020, because you can buy. Oh, there's the Bomberman guys. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I've seen the repo carts with the. <laughs> well, okay, so repo carts are kind of a, kind of a legal gray area, because you know, for example, you know, I've got oh, this the Super, the Super, Super Nintendo Bowl 2020 version cartridge video game. It's oh. right on Amazon. <laughs> here's the, here, here's the thing: is I'm sure that the people who made the conversion aren't actually making the money off of this it's some joe schmo that learned some soldering to put it on a cartridge and then they're just selling it to you for 30 bucks oh, i'm sure because i'm sure you know i've got you know the dragon quest super nintendo games on repro and uh -huh. one one of the like we i think i said something to pendy last time he was the one of the ones that worked on that translation and i'm sure he hasn't he didn't see the dime of the 20 bucks i paid for that cartridge no no because his name is on it as soon as you turn the cartridge on. <laughs> <laughs> Just send him 20 bucks in the mail. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I know I've seen it somewhere. They may be selling it on Etsy or whatever because they keep it up. But maybe the group that runs the tournaments too. But hmm. yeah, they ain't paying any NFL licensing fees. All right. Well, I think Matt has uh, reemerged. Matt, go ahead and unmute yourself. Maybe not. Maybe I can unmute him. No, I cannot unmute him. I've been here the whole time. What are you talking about now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is it good now? You're good. We hear you. Okay. Uh, before I, we go into the next thing, fun fact about reproduction cartridges, mm -hmm. most of them are actually the bigger size Super Nintendo games like Star Fox 64, Super Mario RPG, so that they can have more room to put the actual ROMs of the game on. I always heard that most people used old sports titles to to do that because they were, you know, they're in, there's plenty of them to go around and they're easy to solder. Even though they might be easy to solder, they might not have the same amount of storage that, say, Seiken and Setsu 3 had. Well, that's not well, that's, obviously one they use, but you get my fair. point. But you can argue any Square Enix RPG is always going to be the bigger game. Star Ocean! Yeah. But yeah, I'm ready when y'all are. I just wanted to put that quip in. Yeah, no, go ahead. You want to talk Battle of Olympus. Well, I actually found out about Battle of Olympus really late when I had modded my 2DS. It, for better terms or worse, is a better version of Zelda 2. Battle of Olympus starts... Let me say, my notes disappeared. I need to find them. There we go. Battle of Olympus obviously starts in ancient Greece where you play as, oddly enough, the ancient Greece hero Orpheus. And if you do not know who Orpheus is, he was a legendary musician, poet, and prophet in ancient Greece, Grecian religion. Uh, for the most part, it's 
Uh, I'm not gonna get into Orpheus, but uh, the Battle of Olympus. You're basically Orpheus going to find your girlfriend. You go through a Zelda 2 style world, even with a, a top down map, and you just basically. <laughs> For better terms or worse, it's a better version of Zelda 2. You find different weapons than you would in the game, and you go through and fight mythological, mythological creatures, and eventually kick the butt of several Grecian gods while finding out that Zeus is really rather an okay guy. <laughs> I have played a lot of this game, and... Uh... From what uh, Minecraft says, yeah. It's basically Zelda 2 on steroids. You have a lot of different city-states that you can visit, like uh, Athens uh, and uh, a lot of other Greek states that I can't pronounce properly. Um, what was one of them? I think this even had a Game Boy Advance... Or not a Game Boy Advance, but a Game Boy... Original Game Boy port of it. Um, yep. It was, it, a... it was for the Korean market. But um, this was uh, this was done by the company um, Bra Browderbond, Broderbond. It was Broderbond. Um, Broderbond. It was really the problem with this game was it was so expansive and so well done. It had a very kind of convoluted um, password system, if I remember right. I played through it within the last two years on on an NES, and um, there is, you know, you go into houses, you talk to NPCs, um, there's, it's a lot of, you know, left to right platforming, um, skill battles, and um, item collecting. So you got to talk to NPCs, NPCs give you hints of where to go, what to do, what creatures are weak against what what items you will need to advance to specific states in the game. Like, oh, the, the Gorgon is only weak to the Staff of Fennel. So you have to find where the Staff of Fennel is. To find the Staff of Fennel, NPCs will drop hints on, oh, I heard there was a staff in a cave outside Athens. So you have to kind of write your own little guide on where to go and what to do as you're playing the game because you know this if this game was made in modern times there would be a there would be an in menu kind of note taking um thing for it but way way back in the day for this it was a lot of game for a small NES cartridge and um i always had a problem with trying to rescue the kid that was being held by the Lamia, who, you know, is like this Naga kind of creature with a bow and arrow. And her her boss battle was kind of brutal, because you, you have a club and you have a shield, but it didn't really protect you against the attacks of this boss, so you had to time your jumps to jump over her arrow fire to get up close enough to hit her, and once you beat her, you save the child, and you opened up the next area. So it's a very kind of fetch questy kind of game, and you really have to have great note taking skills to play it. But it is a very satisfying game to play, and it is very based on Greek uh, mythology, because you like like Matt Craft said, you are Orpheus, and you are trying to rescue your girlfriend Helen. But the fun thing is, is at the beginning of the game, you can rename the hero and the the heroine, so you could name it literally anything else. It doesn't have to be Orpheus and Helen. So you could make it yourself and your significant other, if you so chose. Hmm. This uh, this game actually did very well in the European market. Like It was super popular over there, but over here, it was a very missed game. Like Not a lot of people played it. And the game did poorly enough that the developer never made another game like this. <laughs> That's honestly why it ended up getting a Game Boy port in the uh, European market, because it did that freaking well. I, I could have sworn that it came out over here as well. The Game Boy version didn't, but the original version did. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got the original version for the NES. In fact, I'm flipping through the uh, instruction manual for it now. 
You have the instruction manual? Yeah. Yeah, I got it a few years ago. Yeah, here we go. You, you've got Laconia, Attica, Argolis, Arcadia, Phythia. You know, Laconia, Fantasy yeah. Star. Um, I'm going to say again for Yangus and Platy that you guys probably never played this one. Nope. This was this was one of those that just kind of went way <laughs> way way under the radar. You know, it, it kind of became a, a kind of cult, cult classic, classic kind of game that, you know, after the fact, a lot of people probably got their hands on it and played it. But in 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 its heyday, it didn't get a lot of attention. Honestly, like I said, I remember finding it while I was finding random NES games to put on my 2DS. And I remember sitting down and playing it, and I didn't stop until I beat it. And I looked up, it was like six, maybe seven hours later. I was like, Bleh. Dang, dude, you did that in one, one sitting? That's, this is a brutal game. It is not for the faint of heart for people who rely on um, a lot of hand-holding in games these days. This game is you had to sit down, know what you were doing, know where you were going. Um, very heavy inventory management. God forbid you actually took one of the passwords and stopped. It was like a 26 alphanumeric character password. You know, you say all this to try and scare people off, but honestly, you're kind of making me interested in playing the game. You should give it a lie. shot. You, you should honestly give it a shot. Um, it's very... It's it's very easy to emulate. Unlike, I wanted to bring this point up earlier, but we had already passed on Fester's Quest. If you ever want to emulate Fester's Quest, good luck, because you can't. Really? Yeah. Is it like just some copyright protection, or not any, copyright protection? Any, like any emulation protection? Any me. ROM that you any? I think it was just improperly dumped, and that improper dump has just been floating around forever because any ROM that I've ever found of that game, you cannot progress past the start screen. Oh, huh. wow. But, hey, I own two copies of it on the NES. It's super cheap. If you pay more than <laughs> five bucks for it, you're paying too much. <laughs> and that's Looks no like that's the cart that we should be dumping a Tecmo Super Bowl 2020 on. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, the last time I was in New York City, I actually went into a game store and bought a complete in-box copy of Fester's Quest. Oh my goodness. Oh my. I think you're the, Nest, or the I was going to say Nestor's Quest, you're the Fester's Quest super fan. <laughs> you know, I can understand cool, someone though. buying a copy of Donkey Kong off of eBay, but Fester's Quest? I Fester's would only buy it to just troll troll the video game nerd and send it to him through the mail. Yeah, but see, here's the thing. is, I'm a huge Adams Family fan, so for me, growing up, uh -huh. this was Maybe the game to yeah. play. One of the games to mm -hmm. play. Okay. Yeah, I, I joke, but I, I do genuinely mean that's pretty cool that you bought that, though. Like, all, like all of my joking aside, that you know, it, that is cool that you're able to find, like, a full inbox copy like that, and still, you know, I'm, I'm guessing it was in good condition when you found it, right? Oh, yeah. It was in perfect... It, well, it was in acceptable to, you know, near me. You know, whatever the American market for all that crap is. But okay. it wasn't It wasn't a busted copy. Okay. All right. That's cool, um, though. That's awesome you found it. I mean, I've had, my, I've had my copy since I was a kid that my, you know, dad brought home one day from a business trip. And uh, I just bought an inbox copy because I could. Well, there that's, you go. That's, that's the simple reason. <laughs> because I could. Use that adult money. Adult. Yeah. But, uh, huh. yeah, Battle for Olympus. If I would suggest anybody to give that game a shot because it is a very fun game. And uh, if you do enjoy Zelda 2, you will enjoy this game as well. Hmm. I do enjoy Zelda 2. All right. And with that, I guess we have reached our last game. Mr. Yangus, go ahead, take us home. Is right. it Super Mario Brothers 1? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not that predictable, but it is a Nintendo game. Oh, I got it. I got it. Earthbound Zero. No. I, that is a good one, but no. <laughs> Star Tropics. One... No, you get one more guess. 
Mega Man 2. You know I actually thought about doing that one, but no. You were close That's with the, the only start Mega thing, Man I've ever beaten. <laughs> but yeah, the game that I decided to pick for my other one was actually Kirby's Adventure, which was actually one of the last games that came out for the uh, NES because it came out in 1993. At least over uh, here in America, it did. I love that game. It is such a good game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I if I really didn't get much experience with the NES or the Super Nintendo library as a kid. Like like I said, like my first kind of experience with the Super Nintendo was at my cousin's house, and like the first game that I did play was on a Super Nintendo, it was Super Mario World. But with the NES library, most of my experiences firsthand were with the uh, Game Boy Advance remakes of certain games. And the one in particular that I played was Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland, which I didn't find out until a few years later that it was a remake of the original Kirby's Adventure for the NES. So that was one of my first introductions to that game and really kind of like NES games in particular. But with Kirby's Adventure, it was, I believe, the second game of the series at that time. Because I, I, I'm pretty sure it came out before Kirby's Dream Land 2 on the Game Boy, but I could be mistaken on that. I don't fully remember how the history of that series kind of started off. But um, I think so the second Kirby... one was like 94. Okay, so yeah, so this one, so Kirby's Adventure did predate that one then. So uh, with Kirby's Adventure, it was, you know, the second game for the character. Like, he had a good success with Kirby's Dream Land on the Game Boy, uh, just the original Game Boy system. So with the NES game, it was one where they, kind of like with Super Mario Brothers 3, where it really introduced a lot of firsts and a lot of the mainstay sort of features from Mario. Kirby's Adventure did the same thing. Uh, it sort of presented how Kirby games usually are fairly simple with their plot, and they're usually just, you know, Kirby going on a quest to take care of whatever problem might pop up in Dreamland. And in uh, Kirby's Adventures case, uh, that's the land of Dreamland that he lives in, which is on planet Popstar, uh, ends up getting uh, not attacked per se, but everybody loses the ability to have pleasant dreams and sweet dreams and stuff because King Dedede, who's the self-proclaimed king of the land, uh, he ends up taking the Star Rod out of the Fountain of Dreams, which is the main, like one of the key areas that's in the Kirby series, and he takes the Star Rod from it, breaks it into pieces, and scatters it all across Dreamland. So Kirby ends up going off on his little adventure to try and restore the, uh, the Star Rod back to its former glory. And what's really cool cool about Kirby's adventure is like I said it sort of introduced that idea that Kirby will go on these little adventures to save the problems or whatever the case might be and they have little cutscenes to sort of show the different environments that he goes to kind of expanding on what Kirby's dreamland had on the Game Boy but what's really cool about Kirby's adventure is it took that a step further by showing you why the villain did the actions that he did. Because with Kirby's Adventure, when you get to the end of the game and you've reassembled the entire Star Rod, you've beaten King Dedede at the Fountain of Dreams, and he's knocked out, he goes flying off screen. Well, Kirby is then finally able to collect the last piece, puts the Star Rod back together, and starts making his way to the fountain. But as he's getting closer to the fountain, all of a sudden King Dedede jumps out of nowhere, starts grabbing onto Kirby and like trying to pull him back and shakes his head like, no, don't go, don't go any closer to it. You know, something might happen. But Kirby just ends up swatting him away with the star rod, puts the star rod back on the fountain, thinking that he's, you know, saved the day. And all of a sudden, this entity comes bursting forth from the fountain that's called Nightmare. It's an evil wizard type character that was originally causing problems in Dreamland before DDD sealed him away with by removing the star rod and sealing him into the Fountain of Dreams. And it's really cool how this game sort of set up what other Kirby games would do as they follow, where a character might... They might be a villain character, per se, or not like an antagonistic character like DD is. He's Really, he's a harmless villain in the long scheme of things with Kirby games, because usually he does things for kind of selfish reasons, usually, but he's not an evil, evil character by any means. And you get to see how his actions actually were trying to him save Dreamland, even though he's not necessarily a good guy. But getting away from how the game presents the, uh, the story for you. What's cool about Kirby's Dream Land is sort of like how Mario Brothers 3 introduced world maps to uh, the Mario Brothers series. Kirby's Adventure introduced um, world progression, where instead of it just being like one level that you would be and that would be your world in particular, you now had different levels that you would complete in order to get to the end of a world. Like, so Kirby's Adventure has a, has a funny naming scheme for stuff. Everything's basically named after food. You have Vegetable Valley, Ice Cream Island, Butter Building. Uh, one of my favorite worlds is Orange Ocean, which is World 6 in the game. And as you progress through the game, you actually see 
both the levels themselves change in environment as you go through. Like as you get towards the end of, um, say, Yogurt Yard, which is World 5, you actually start to see an ocean pop up in the background of levels, even on the NES original. And you would see the ocean sort of pop up in the background. And as you keep going through the level, you know, the water becomes more prevalent. You see there's a ship in the distance, too. You know, you start seeing the ocean turn from like a like um, the standard blue color to more of an orangish shade of coloring, which is really impressive that the NES could do that sort of thing too with the changing of the screens and how they handled the colors and everything. And when you then get uh, you defeat the boss of Yogurt Yard, you go on and you go through the door, you get the star rod piece from defeating the boss, and there you are, you're in Orange Ocean, and you see, oh, okay, so there's a natural progression as you're going through your adventure which is really cool to see that in a platformer, I think, because it gives you that sense of kind of like how you guys were talking about with like Simon's Quest and some of the other games. You get that mm-hmm. real sense of progression as you're going through the levels. And that's why what that's one of the reasons why Kirby's Adventure is one of my favorite Kirby games, because you really get that sense of progression as you're going through. And I find that really satisfying for a platformer. And um, what was also cool about Kirby's Adventure is it actually was the first Kirby game that introduced... Uh, power-ups for Kirby. So with Kirby's Dream Land, he could swallow enemies and, like, spit them out or just swallow them. They would just disappear entirely. But he couldn't really attack unless he would get, like, the spicy curry item or he would, like, blow his little puffs of air. But with Kirby's Adventure, he actually gave him specific power-ups from swallowing different enemies. So you could swallow, like, the one-eyed waddle Doos as they're walking around, and it would give Kirby the beam attack when it shoots, like, an arcing beam out in front of him. Or you could swallow one of Meta Knight's cronies. Um, I think they're just called Sword Knights. And it gives you the sword power-up. Uh, there's the Sir Kibble enemies, which will give you the cutter attack. So you can throw like a boomerang of sorts out in front of you. And it will come flying back behind you then. I like the UFO the best. Oh, yes. The UFO is probably one of the coolest power-ups you can get in this game, for sure. It's one of those ones that you can only find in specific rooms of levels. And you... It's one of those power-ups that, unfortunately, when you beat the level, you can't take it with you. It's just kind of a one-time thing in that particular world. But usually the worlds, or sorry, usually the levels that you get the UFO power-up in, it's really good. Like, they purposely will give you plenty of blocks to break, plenty of tough enemies that you can charge up the super beam and shoot through all of them. So it's really satisfying when you do come across it. And it has appeared in a few other Kirby games as sort of an Easter egg power-up that you can get for uh, certain times. You completely uh, forgot about the cooking ability. Or did that only appear in Superstar? C- cooking is not in Kirby's Adventure. Yeah, that I'm, was uh, Superstar. Yep. I'm going to go hit my head on a wall now. Oh, no, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, it's all good. There's a lot of Kirby power-ups, and sometimes they only appear once. So, <laughs> like, painting is an ability from Kirby Superstar that's only really appeared in that game. So there's, there's a lot of power-ups in this series. I think somebody actually has a list of every single one, too. But, um... Anyway, so with um, with Kirby's Adventure, like, to me, this is probably my favorite NES game, for sure. Like, I love playing the original NES version, whether it's on my NES Classic or on my Nintendo Switch or on um, my Wii Virtual Console when I used to play on my Wii a lot more. I like um, the 3DS version of it, the 3D. You know, yeah, you know, I really like that one, too. And that's one that I would personally recommend somebody if they're looking for a way to play the original, but maybe they want to have it a little more fine-tuned almost like because with the 3d i think it's called 3d classic yeah. kirby's adventure yeah um it has a really cool uh, stereoscopic 3d effect where if you turn it on like certain blocks will look like they cast more of a shadow behind them it gives the levels a really good 3d depth and it, it's a really cool when you get to the butter building stages because there's a particular stage towards the end of butter building where kirby is on the outside of the building towards the top of it and he's running along to the right and as you run, there's this really cool effect where it looks like the tower is moving with Kirby as he's running. So it gives it like a 3D object effect. And with the 3D stereoscope version in the 3D classic version, it's a really cool thing to see it. I'm not going to lie. I was like, wow, that's really cool looking, actually. <laughs> but um, oh, Yeah, I, I know the section you're talking about to where you kind of have to spiral your way up the tower you enter yes. through the door you work your way to the right or to the left and it kind of corkscrews up the tower and enemies appear and all that kind of stuff and it was very a very neat kind of thing to see on the nes because a lot of stuff didn't do that mm-hmm. yeah it's a really there's a lot of really cool stuff that kirby that they pulled up with kirby's adventure and you know even though 
you know, looking back and we've seen how far games have come now, there's still a lot of really cool stuff about what they were able to do. And like, I think this game has one of the really cool, like color schemes for a Nintendo or entertainment system game too, because level like enemies in particular, they're, they're, you always see the same enemies throughout the entire game. But whenever you go into new worlds or new levels and stuff, enemies will always change their colors. Like sometimes they might be more of a purplish hue when you get towards the end of the game, like Waddle Dees from the beginning, normally they're an orangish brown color. They take on more of a bluish hue to them. And like Sir Kibbles will turn green depending on your stages. So you get a really yeah. cool variety of colors as you're playing through it. And even on the Game Boy Advance uh, remake of Nightmare in Dreamland, they still had that sort of effect where when you get to the last world uh, rainbow resort, um, you would still see enemies take on those different color hues and they might get a little faster or they might get a little more aggressive, you know, depending on what the situation was. So it's cool to see how this game could keep the same enemies throughout the entire experience, but change them up in ways as you were progressing through. You know, uh, one thing I enjoyed about Kirby's Adventure, it was one of the first games for me that kind of telegraphed, hey, there's secret here. Do you, secrets here. Do you know how to find them? And I found that out with, you know, after every time you finish a level, you know, you've got your door and the door closes. But if the door was like, I, be I believe it was, oh, if it's still orange or mm -hmm. if it was an orange door, there's a secret in this level that you can find. Yep. Yeah, that was a really cool feature for that one because, the, like you say, the doors will stay that color and it lets you know that, oh, there's a secret switch. And not every stage has a secret switch. And for the most part, they're usually pretty telegraphed, like how you can get to it, or there's a hint somewhere along the way where you can find it. But then you get some stages where they're really hidden really well. Like there's really not a hint for you unless you just happen to just come across it by total chance. Yeah, like, like one of you my need a specific power up. To yep. reach one of the yep. secrets. <laughs> like, one of the ones that I always find the most notorious, like, even though I've replayed this game so many times, it's when you get to Orange Ocean Level 3. There's one in the pirate ship that you have to get to. You have to have um, the hammer power-up, which is already a kind of a rare ability to find in the game. And you have to go through a certain window. As I believe it's after you've raised the water level inside the base of the ship. You got to do like certain steps in order to get to that room, and if you make the mistake, you end up progressing further in the stage, and you got to try again and again if you keep missing it. It's one of those ones that, even though I've played this game a lot of times, it still just to this day just gives me a hard time actually getting it right because I always mess up a step or two, and I have to replay the stage like three or four times. <laughs> yeah, because it's a window that's not very obvious. So no. as you walk by, it's not like, oh, hey, you can if you jump here and press up, you'll go you'll go through this. Um, you know this block of uh, you know black, to yeah. because I think it was like two different rooms, and they weren't the way to enter them weren't like very intuitive. You just kind of had to know the flow of the level to mm -hmm. access the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's. I know oh, I know ahead. exactly. I, I was just gonna say I know the spot you're talking about exactly. Okay, I'm I'm glad that you feel my pain on that one too because. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's tough. There are some tough secret stages or secret switches to find, but thankfully most of them are towards the end of the game anyway, where you're getting to the point where it, there's a genuine challenge kind of creeping up on you. And that is one of the things I will say about that Kirby's Adventure does handle nicely. Like Kirby games usually are, you know, fairly easy for the most part, I would say. But the difficulty does feel like it sort of naturally progresses the further you get into it and bosses will feel like a, a genuine kind of challenge to kind of test your skills a little bit more as you're playing. Uh, it, yeah, it takes, it, the, it takes the Mario approach to it mm -hmm. of, you know, hey, we're going to give you a section of level that, you know, if you fail, there's, you know, there's, you'll hit, you'll hit ground. And then mm -hmm. we're going to introduce this again later, but there won't be ground there. Mm-hmm. And if you fail, you lose a life. And Kirby games do that very early on of, oh, these are very easy to, to work their way through. And then the platforming gets more complex. The bot, the, you know, the enemy patterns get a little harder. Mm -hmm. And you use everything that you've learned in previous easier levels to finish the harder late game levels. Mm-hmm. 
That's one of the cool things about Kirby, too, is that, you know, since you learn so much from playing just the game and, like, you see how the levels sort of teach you what to expect, you usually can unlock a new mode in a Kirby game then to make the experience a little tougher for you, which Kirby's Adventure actually had that, too, where Kirby's Dream Land had it where when you beat the game, you got, like, a special code that you could push the certain buttons on the title screen and you would make, like, a harder version of the game for yourself. But with yeah, Kirby's I, I, Extra mode. I think yep. extra mode. I think it was called extra mode in Kirby's Adventure as well. It is indeed because Kirby's Adventure's 100% secret was you act, unlock extra mode, and it's essentially a one shot version of the game where you have to get through it, but you only get three hits. You can replenish them, but you only get three hits for the whole game. And you have to try and beat the game in one sitting, pretty much, because you can't pause and save like you could with the normal game. You gotta just go through it. (laughs) Here's the fun part, is the 3D Classics version follows the same rule set of... They, you know, in the base game, in the non-extra version, you can kind of save and quit and come back and everything. But once you unlock extra mode, you have to do that in one go. You can close your 3DS to suspend it like you can with any game, but you can't leave the software. Otherwise, you lose all your progress. Yep. It's a, it's definitely a real challenge because Kirby's Adventure is you know f- fairly reasonable with difficulty. But when you only have three hits, it can get pretty hair raising at some point it gets, it gets brutal fast it, it does. does and it, it really does. does within like the second or third world you're already just kind of sweating a little bit yeah it, and the thing is too you can't use the mini games which something i didn't really touch on earlier but every time that you get to a new uh, world map area there's different mini game doors you can go into which in the original nes version it's like a crane game there's an egg catching game and i believe it's a shooting game for the other one where like you yeah. like a quick draw game it's a quick and draw game. When you play extra mode, like normally the games have a, a natural sort of level of progression as you go through the game. But when you play extra mode, they're automatically all set to the highest difficulty every single time. So it can get really hard to get extra lives from them. So you got to know where extra lives are at when you're playing the base game and just like going through levels. <laughs> Otherwise, oh, it gets oh, yeah. really oh, hard. Yeah. It's, it's real hard to hit those um, those crane game extra lives when once once you get to late game and extra mode. It gets Gosh. real hard. It does. But um, let me see. What I think is really cool about uh, this is kind of jump into the Game Boy Advance version here real quick. But that version also had extra mode where you had to play the game with three hearts and stuff. And you can only you had to do it once. I, no, I think you could save in that one. I think you could save in the Game Boy Advance version of it. I but don't think you, I played that version. I, th- I think you can save in that one if I remember right. Because I remember that the reward for beating extra mode 100% is you unlock another mode which is essentially the same thing but a speed run called Meta Nightmare, where you play through the entire game as Meta Knight, who uh, was actually introduced in Kirby's Adventure as Kirby's sort of rival. And it, it's sort of believed that Meta Knight is the same species as Kirby, because when you beat Kirby, or sorry, when you beat Meta Knight at the end of Orange Ocean, his mask does break off and he looks exactly like Kirby just instead with uh, yellow eyes and a little white mouth instead of uh, Kirby's, you know, big black eyes and his little pink mouth that he usually has. Yeah. That happens in uh, Kirby Superstar too, doesn't it? Yeah, usually if there's a, a Kirby game where you fight Meta Knight as a boss, usually his mask breaks off at the end of it and you see like, oh, well, he looks like Kirby. <laughs> but they never flat out are like, oh yeah, they're the same species, but it's it's pretty strongly implied throughout all the games that they're pretty much the same breed of character <laughs> but um yeah so just to kind of finish up my thoughts with kirby's adventure it definitely is a game that is a lot of fun to play through it's got some really cool references like even though it was the second game in the series it was really cool how uh it had a full-out reference towards the end of the game with the last level of rainbow resort where it's a full black and white uh, almost a recreation of kirby's dreamland on the game boy and even without that, there's still a lot of fun things to this game. Like, there's all the mini games, there's all the power ups you can mess with. There's a lot of different ways you can play through the game with the power ups and everything. And there's a lot of challenges, too, depending on what version you play. And whether you, like, I would personally recommend the 3D Classics version if you haven't played Kirby's Adventure. And whether you've played a Kirby game or not, this is a good one to get into. Because, like, the Game Boy Advance version was my first introduction to a a classic 2D Kirby game like that. And that's a good way to go. Or you can go with the 3D Classic version, like I mentioned. You you really can't go wrong. It's like Super Mario Bros. 3. You can't go wrong with which version of you play. Or, or Honestly, which version of, of you play, excuse me. If you've if you've got the if you have a three DS and you have seven dollars, 
I would highly suggest the the 3D Classics version. It's probably the the most definitive way to play the game, I guess, at this point. Mm Because I don't know how many times this game has been released, but it's probably the best way to play it unless you you know you own a NES and just kind of want a cartridge of it. Yeah, because it is it's it is pure and simple the NES version just given a 3D makeover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, you can't go wrong with whatever version you play it. But like Brewery and said, 3D Classics version definitely a good way to go if you're looking to play the original, but with a a few little new touches and a few little quality of life things like a little improvements on uh, controls and stuff and the best thing it's cheap exactly (laughs) you know you completely forgot something about kirby at least kirby's adventure what's that first first you draw a circle then you dot the eyes (laughs) at a great big smile and presto it's kerbo it's kerbo it's kerbo i mean if you think about it it showed most of us how to draw it was the first Mario paint. <laughs> well, I'm glad you started saying that because when you said I forgot something, I was going to start singing the Kirby right back at you theme song. Kirby, Kirby, Kirby. That's the name you should know. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That does not need to exist. No. Kirby, Kirby, Kirby. He's the star of the show. He's more than you think. He's got maximum paint. Kirby, Kirby, Kirby's the one. And I'll stop there. All right, when uh, Yanga starts singing, you know that it's time to uh, cut off the mics and uh... <laughs> rare insult right there. Wrap, wrap it up. I'm hurt so much. I mean, if I was singing, then you'd probably have to check my blood alcohol level or uh, <laughs> plug your ears, one or the other. So, uh... <laughs> I mean, I still have to take a tr- I still have to take a cab to All Trades Abbey. So, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you woke up for the second half of the episode, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> so, all right. The, the, we've, we we did an eight-pack tonight. A little bit uh, more than our Final Fantasy episode. A little bit less than our Game Boy one. But uh hope you enjoyed hearing about uh, Castlevania, Tecmo Super Bowl, Fester, Boulder Dash, Mario, Kirby, Faxanadu, and the Greek gods in the Battle of Olympus. So uh, that's it for this episode of Slime Time SideQuest. We do want to thank both Brewery and Matt Craft for joining us to talk about our favorite NES titles. Glad to be no, here. Thank you for having me, even though I slept. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. We definitely got a lot to talk about out of these eight games, that's for sure. Look, look I understand Fester's Quest is a boring game, but <laughs> that doesn't excuse you to fall asleep. <laughs> Oh, funny. He was just dreaming about the aliens you were talking about. That's all it was. <laughs> the, the game started getting trippy, and, you know... <laughs> he was just recreating what you were talking about. He was dreaming <laughs> about the aliens like Fester did. <laughs> or, or I saw, no, I saw Wednesday and Pugsley chasing thing around the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You might have noticed that the only time we ever mention Patreon on this podcast is when we say we don't use it. We're all just longtime fans that want to speak about the topics we know and we love so much. Um, if you do want to have some money that you would like to donate to people, consider sliding on over to the Dragon's Den at www.wudis.com slash den. Click on that button that says support the site. Woodus has owned and maintained that site for over 20 years. He'd appreciate any donation that you would like to give his way. Um, or if you don't want to give it directly, you can use his Amazon affiliate links to make purchases, uh, especially, you know, if you're behind the times on Dragon Quest XI S, um, any of the 3DS titles, um, and upcoming, I know we're going to have some more Dragon Quest XI S's, <laughs> PS4 versions, and uh, Xbox. Don't know if they're all just digital or not, but I mean, if they're going to be on Amazon, they're going to be on the den through his affiliate link. Won't cost you a penny, but it might give a penny to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have any suggestions for any future side quest episodes, uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. You can reach out to Platty uh, via his Twitter, PlattyM3. Or via Discord for the Dragon's Den forum that we have created. Uh, you can also contact me, uh, Yangus the Legendary Bandit, on the Dragon's Den via a personal message. Uh, just search for my name. Uh, it's just Yangus the Legendary Bandit, no spaces. Uh, we have a list full of ideas, and we're always looking to add more to it, whether it's over a specific game or a specific series, or you know, like we've done for this in the last episode, where we take a system 
and we each make a list of stuff. You know, whatever ideas you have, we're happy to hear them, and we're happy to add them to the list for a future possible episode. Yep. Bye, everyone. Side quest complete. Thank <music> you.